Hello, and welcome to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. I'm Ryan Purvis, your host, supported by our producer Heather Bicknell. In this series, you'll hear stories and opinions from experts in the field, stories from the front lines, the problems they face and how they solve them, the areas they're focused on from technology, people and processes, to the approaches they took that will help you to get to the scripts for the digital workspace inner workings. Welcome, Ashley, to the Digital Workspace Work podcast. Do you want to give us a brief introduction to who you are and what you're doing? Sure. Thanks, Ryan. So my name is Ashley Woodhull. I've been in and around the cybersecurity space for around 10 years now. Started from university days where I was bored at school and I kind of interest, I found some interest in messing around with computers and it kind of went from there. I grew gradually more interested in security and worked my way through quite a few different jobs in financial services and retail, a couple of other spaces, and mostly focusing on the risk side of cybersecurity. So understanding or helping organizations tackle what are the biggest gaps, the biggest risks that could perhaps cause problems for them when it comes to things like data breaches. And a couple of years ago, I started my own consulting company called Practical InfoSec, which is currently undergoing a name change because that was something I thought about overnight, almost. As and we, do, what we yeah. do, as we do. <laughs> and what we're focusing on a little bit more now is helping organizations that are in the purposeful space, so they're doing something good for the people and planet, and trying to make those secure through a couple of different services. Great, great. And I mean, your, your switch over to consulting, I mean, uh, was that based on just the opportunity that presented itself or, you know, you just you always wanted to be on your own and, and, and build your own thing? Yeah, good question. There's a bit of a story there. So I had a kind of a bit of an itch for a couple of years. In fact, it, it all started when I went traveling. I went traveling around South America when I was about 26, I think it was. Yeah. And during that trip, I had some time to reflect for the first time in my adult life. And I realized that I had this itch to start something. And cybersecurity was the thing that I knew and loved. So yeah. it was just kind of a, a snowball effect from there, let's say. And consulting was the obvious way to go. But uh, what actually happened was after I came back from that trip, I took a job. I worked in a security operations center actually for a while for the first time to see what that side of things looked like. Yeah. Um, I grew kind of, it got repetitive for me. Okay. And I grew tired quite fast. So I said, right, okay, I'm going to take one more job. And if the next job doesn't work for any reason at all, I'm going to start my own gig. And that's exactly what I did. So I took the next job. Then I ended up working for a big financial firm, working in cyber strategy. Didn't quite work out how I planned. So I perfectly COVID landed. And it was kind of beneficial to me in some ways that it gave me that space. I think you had a very similar story, actually. Yeah. So I had the space and the time to figure out what I wanted to do. So consulting for me allowed me to do cybersecurity in, in the way that I think makes the most sense and helping more of the smaller organizations rather than the corporates. And that way, having a bit more impact and having closer relationships with the leadership teams mm -hmm. uh, and kind of helping give them peace of mind really when it comes to IT and security. So that was something I couldn't do, I felt in a corporate job. So, yes, that's why consulting <laughs> was the path for me. Yeah, pretty similar. I mean, I, I don't I don't miss um, I don't uh, always miss being in corporate. I quite like some of the corporate stuff, but I think having that flexibility sometimes to to go deep on something or get involved in someone else's stuff and then exit or come back later at, at, a, at, a, at a lighter touch is a nice thing to of, of this sort of role. Uh, of being a consultant. I mean, you're not, not necessarily in their weeds every day. And then you, in the corporate world, you know, you, you can find different projects and different things to do. I think there's pros and cons. I mean, personally, I think if I didn't have a corporate background, I don't think a lot of the stuff that I learned would be as useful because I've, you know, worked in places where you learn a lot because it's it's a big, complicated place, which helps in going into smaller places. Whereas if I think I stayed outside of it, I would never have learned, you know, and I wouldn't be as, as well skilled as I am now, I think is probably my I don't know if you feel the same. Absolutely. No, I fully agree. I think having that having that time on the inside allows you to get 
if anything, I think empathy for how organizations operate and understanding mm-hmm. that it's not quite as you learn it at university, let's say. Oh, yeah, or, yeah or, that's, or that's very mean. true, yeah. <laughs> Um, but it definitely helps. And, and especially when you've been working in larger organizations, you can see what a mature, whatever it is, looks like, whether it's security or IT or HR or whatever it is. And then you can scale that down when you start working with the smaller companies and just focus on those basics and do them well. And that's what I quite like about it as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you mentioned risk. I mean, that, that was one of the things that I, I really appreciate. I mean, working in banks, you automatically have this appreciation because it's drilled into you that. The data is important. You've got to protect it. It's customer stuff, you know, and and everything you do is is got a a a tint. That's what is the risk of doing this? How could, you know, could I bring down the organization? You know, all those sorts of things. And when you go to other organizations, I'll never forget going to another company that wasn't in in financial services, and I got handed a laptop, and the drive wasn't encrypted. I was like, excuse me, like what's going on here? Why is this drive not encrypted? Oh no, we you know we haven't got there. You know it's not it's not important. I was like, well, uh, it's important because you know I'm going to be having you know company data on here, and I can you know the laptop I'm going to travel, it get lost, and it just couldn't get that that through certain people. It was just a you know a frustrating uh, experience. And ironically, at about the same time the ICO came into play uh, as an organization for data protection, and and the um, the, the the GDPR regulations were put into place and all of a sudden people started caring about that kind of stuff because there was a tangible fine that was associated for losing data one way or another right no that definitely helped i think gdpr did what it needed to be it was it, i think it did what it was brought in to do yeah which is which is interesting actually because it in reality very few firms have been fined when it comes to security at least i think it's 10 or 15 maybe a few more now um, you have to be neg- negligible, let's say, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, to get those fines. But on the compliance side of things, I think it's a bit different, uh, particularly with marketing and, and, a few other, and a few other areas. But GDPR definitely helps people realize that there's, there's a reason this is here and there is, there is something that we need to do <laughs> to stay yeah. on the right side of, of the law, let's say. Well, you, I mean, you shared a story on your, on your profile of the CEO that uh, – was breached twice, I think, mm-hmm. and and how he tried to hide it. I can't remember exactly all the details of the story, but I, you know that, ha- that that was happening probably a lot more often prior to some of these regulations coming in. And you do see, I mean, I think Facebook or Meta got fined now a rather, a rather large sum finally, and British Airways was one. I'm trying to think who else has been been fined, but there's been a few definitely noticeable ones in the press for their breaches. Yeah. British Airways comes to mind. I think they had one of the biggest fines because of a security breach. Yeah. Um, but the the one I shared recently was, no, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a super interesting example. And I think you've got to look at it in a lens of these types of things don't happen very often. So I wasn't intending to scare anybody by posting about <laughs> that, but it's such an interesting story that I think it had to be shared. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and what happened there in a nutshell was... We're talking about a a firm, I think, in Norway, not relevant. They are a psychotherapy company, so they do online psychotherapy sessions. And they'd become quite successful doing that. I think they did have tens of thousands of patients at one point. They suffered a data breach. Yeah. Details of that are a little bit unclear. The CEO at the time was also responsible for IT, so... Everything IT and security related went through him. Yeah. And so he was the only person that knew about this breach. And this breach appeared to disclose the details of patients, therapy notes, personal data, of course, super sensitive stuff when you think about it. Um, He covered that up. A couple of years later, there was a new breach. And this time, the criminals communicated with the CEO and asked for a ransom. They said, if you don't pay us, this much money. It it was a hundred a few hundred thousand, I think. I can't remember exactly how much it was now, but it was I remember, reasonable. I remember four hundred four hundred thousand for the one. But I can't right. remember what the first one was. So four hundred K and this I think this was a company turning over quite a few million at this point. So not <laughs> not outrageous sums, but relatively, depending how you look at it. CEO said no. Cyber criminals said, Okay, we need to change our tactics here. Let's go after the patients. Hmm. 
So they went after the patients, giving them smaller ransoms in demand for not basically putting their information online. And obviously at that point, the news got out what had happened. And the board directors of this company were obviously shocked that this had even happened in the first place. The yeah. CEO got fired at that point, but um, the damage had already been done by then. And yeah. the company actually went bankrupt not long after that second breach was public. But this is all quite some time ago. I think this was maybe 2018, 2019. And the CEO has just been put in, I don't think he's been put in prison. He's been given a suspended, a suspended sentence, I think, for, um, for co- the cover-up, basically. So you've got a re- really interesting combination there of events. You've got the, the CEO that perhaps if he'd done the right thing in the first place, that wouldn't have been so severe, the consequences for everybody involved. Um, there's, there's some other interesting angles about the cyber criminal behind it. He was a wanted hacker. Yeah. And he actually published, he copied and pasted his desktop by accident online as part of this uh, <laughs> as part yeah. of this breach. And that allowed him to be identified ultimately. So there's a lot of people that are making lots of mistakes in this story. Yeah. Um, but sadly, lots of vulnerable, sensitive people had their their therapy notes published online, which is just the scariest thing that I can imagine, really. <laughs> uh, no, I, so I mean, it's a brutal outcome. Yeah, I mean, if you think about, I mean, you, you could see this even without it being that sensitive. I mean, you know, the stories of, of people being fired because of social media that they've posted, you know, things on Facebook or, or Twitter that we that were used as a way i mean we we had to hire we had to fire someone because we have something you posted on facebook about the business and you know it was very unpleasant but that i mean that's something they deliberately put into the public eye so now you've got stuff that wasn't meant to go into the public domain that's been put out there that could affect somebody's life you know down the down the road uh i mean that's frightening to be fair i mean you know He's lucky. To, he's lucky to get off with just a suspended sentence, to be honest, because it's 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 almost the hubris of the first time and then being caught the second time, as opposed to just taking the the knock for being caught the first time and then just doing the right thing, which is you know securing the business and realizing you're out of your depth. Because I mean, who can you know if you're not specialising in this stuff, you're going to be out of your depth. Because um, the guys that are are are, are attacking are specialising. Right. Exactly. And it's. It's kind of sad because when you're a small business, you do have to wear all of the hats. You do have to wear the IT hat, the marketing hat, yeah. the HR hat. Um, but there should be a degree in which you take those hats off and you give them to somebody else sure. who's a bit more capable. Um, the, the reason for one of the breaches, I think it might have been the second one, was a default database password. So the password that was published, sorry, the database that was published online yeah, for collating all of the personal details and, and the notes. That was publicly accessible, but the credentials, there were some passwords on there, but the password was the default password for that database system. So the hackers had no problem whatsoever getting getting into that, of course. So when you're talking about those kind of errors, I mean, they're easily made when you, when you start a company, but if you're then taking revenue of... The, the millions and you're talking thousands of customer records then mm. you would have expected there to be a, a prompt to review security at some point <laughs> during that journey well, yeah i mean this and, and there's standards for them I mean, I mean there's the iso 27k and there's the NIST standards that you just have to follow not say follow but you you know if you're dealing with data you should be doing that that compliance i mean i said it's a no-brainer but it's, it's it's a minimum nowadays i mean in, in a pen test is, is part of that. I mean, just to have a basic pen test. I mean, you can automate pen tests now, so you don't even have to pay fortunes to have someone come and just ru- run the usual scans and, and point out the usual problems. So it is, it is criminal to an extent to not do that stuff. So it, uh, negligent is the right word. It's it's sad you had to learn it, you know, that way. Um, you know, you'd, you'd think there'd be a little bit of a proactiveness, but you know, what can we do? We can only only teach others, I guess, or, or make sure we don't do the same the same mistake. Right, exactly. It does, and this is why these stories, as, as sad as they are, they have to be published because they're they're absolutely there to be learned from. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And um, I mean, we were talking before this around um, the fatigue of some of the things that we have to deal with, uh, multi-factor or the or multi-factor fatigue. That's a mouthful. I mean, what are your thoughts on that sort of stuff, and and how are you coaching 
around it? No, good question. There's there's a really interesting topic there in itself, I think, about that the user experience side when it comes to digital security. Uh, MFA fatigue is a big one. We have, on average, we all have around 100 accounts. Now, they're mostly personal accounts. Mm. But if you're talking about having MFA, that second factor set up on every one of those, that's going to slow you down <laughs> exponentially. It's going to slow you down to the point where you don't want to use the internet anymore. So I think for, for, for me, what, what I was talking about earlier is when I go into an organization and I help them understand this stuff, it's about the risk-based approach and turning on MFA for the applications that they have some criticality criticality around them so then maybe this database we were just talking about perhaps which has all of these customer records in that's the kind of thing you would want yeah. to set an mfa token up for but it's not everything i think that's the, the the key difference moving on to to passwords which is kind of looking at the same problem we've got a, a statistic came out when we did some research just at the end of last year that we found a very interesting one Supposedly, the average amount of time people spend entering passwords and clicking, I forgot my password, is 11 minutes per week, which oh, really? is it's not a huge figure, but when you add that up, that's that's around 10 hours a year. Yeah. Spent, <laughs> spent typing passwords or spent resetting passwords. And uh, passwords are slowly dying, which is good news, and there are other solutions, thankfully, finally, coming to replace them because they've been around for a long, long time. But that was never a sustainable model either, mm. particularly when you have websites with have which have their own level of requirements, uppercase, lowercase, symbols, numbers, 15 long, 20 long. So the, the key takeaway from the fatigue side of things and user experience side of things is two things. One, to use single sign-on wherever possible. So yep. the employee signs in once and they get access to things like the HR, their training system. They don't have to keep logging in. And for everything else, having a password manager. And those really are, for me, it's been a lifesaver. I mean, it's definitely saved me those 11 minutes every week, having a password manager that's set up well. Yeah. That will, when, whenever I go to Netflix, <laughs> Not all I'm working, of course. Whenever yeah. I go to Netflix, it will just fill it in straight for me without me having to think about it. That is, is for me, it's a game changer. And password managers have their own flaws, but I think they have they save time and they're efficient and they're secure if they set up right. So that's another thing that I would always recommend organizations do. Well, I mean, I I, um, I was a LastPass client and now I've moved to Bitwarden, and, and I have found that usability to be very different. And and some odd ways that that, that Bitwarden works for stuff, but it but it definitely has been good. And I, and I use the Apple built-in password manager as well, um, which I find quite good. And and you're right. I think that ability to not have to memorize a lot of passwords is important because you end up people end up using the same ones, which is or, or, or versions of the same one with with just additional letters added on or numbers, mostly numbers. Um, so I think that's a good thing to be away from. And, and, I, and I have looked at, I mean, talking about streaming services, I have noticed that a few of them have become quite intelligent in the sense that, like I think Disney, if you're on the same network, Wi-Fi network, and you're inside the app on your phone, which you've logged into, it'll automatically sign in on the device. You don't have to actually do too much. And then the other ones, I think you have to, I think I think Amazon Prime, you have to enter a four-digit code on your device and then it'll It'll link up and and I think the other one, which I thought was quite novel as well, was you you scanned a QR code and it used that to authenticate you through the app as well. Because I mean, all my passwords are generated, so they're, they're never short. And and to type that with a, with a, with a, with the remote control like, TV <laughs> remote and and you know uppercase lowercase special characters, it, it I, I yeah, almost refuse to do it. But you know, I think if that's if that's the the, the sort of non-enterprise place, the, the sort of commercial, what everyone's getting used to as, as as the end user, the companies have to do something similar. So you're, you're pointing around single sign-on, you know, any product you bring into your environment should have an MFA capability and be able to tie into your, your authentication provider. At least, you know, a modern one. There are some that'll probably have to catch up, but it does make life easier. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, those two things can save employees a lot of time. Um, there's a couple of interesting things about that. So single sign-on usually comes at additional cost when you're looking at things like SaaS tools. Yeah. So we call this the security poverty line. Usually the cheapest version of the product doesn't have the security built in, which is not helpful in many ways. Um, the, good, the other thing about single sign-on is, uh, I'm trying to kind of give this holistic picture a little bit here, but it's perfect for the convenience side of things, of course, because you're just logging into your, your work system once and you get access to a lot of other stuff, great. But this is where the maybe the risk stuff comes back in again. If a cyber criminal gets access to your single sign-on, mm -hmm. they also get access to everything else by default. Yeah, sure. So there's that angle as well to think about, which is maybe when you think about addi additionally enabling an extra step for various systems that are important. So perhaps that database, for example. Yeah. Keep going back to that one. So it's great having single sign-on, but don't apply it broadly to everything. <laughs> it would be the recommendation. Think about what what systems are more critical and sensitive and who needs access to them. Not everybody yeah. probably. Yeah. And doing it that way. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, yeah, I agree with you. You know, there's there's a and it's funny you say that because you know we're building this product at the moment and single sign on is part of the design, but we haven't put it, we haven't put it in the first version because we couldn't get it to work right away, which it'll come quite quickly afterwards. But my intention always was to move away from a password uh, username password model to a you know tie in with with Microsoft or Google or or one of those guys who who will enforce you know not even enforce it but they will already have users on there that have already been securely logged into other places. So you already know there's a certain level of uh, validation and verification that's happened. Plus, if someone's logging in to those interfaces, you're typically going to get someone that is already trained on or comfortable with the, the multi-factor step that they have to go through. My one frustration with Microsoft uh, recently, and I actually need to find out how to turn this off. I, I'm very happy with with uh, I was very happy with the way that the Authenticator app worked, where it would pop up a notification for you to approve, and that you were trying to log into your, the, the the application you were logging into, and that's all you had to do. Now that what they've added is an extra step, we have to input input the number that's on the screen. So if the number is 24, you've got to go find the notification and then type in 24 and then submit it. Why that's a pain for me is that often when I'm signing into something, I was literally tapping approve on my watch, but now I get the approval notification and I have to still go back to my phone to to unlock and to go and fill in the number. And I don't think it's adding that much more validation to the exercise. I just feel like it's a it's a bell, not a and a whistle, not a, a functional improvement. I don't know what you think about that, but that kind of leads me to the fatigue point of point myself. Where I'm going, well, I don't want this anymore. I wanted the simple thing. Hmm. That's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because it comes back again to that, those weighing scales of you can't have security and convenience at the same time. It's always one or the other or a balance. Because the the interesting thing there is, I think there was some report, it must have been a good year ago now that I read, about the, the MFA or two-step verification, whatever you want to call that, via a accept or decline notification. And they are fantastic because they're fast. Yeah. The issue that the companies found that was that again it comes back to fatigue. The employees are receiving so many that they just click accept without even thinking if it was them. Mm. So that's one side of the coin. I think the other one is is again if it's a cyber criminal logging in, you can't just accept anymore because then you need to write the code, but there's nowhere to put the code because it's not your session. Yeah, yeah. So I think it adds an extra layer, but does it? I, I think you may be right. Is it too much? Is it going to make people turn it off? Because that's well, that's the enemy. And in, in the end, is when th people think, okay, I'm going to turn that off now because it's a pain in the ass. I can't do it through my watch anymore. I got used to that, and now security is slowing me down. And uh, that that's when it becomes the enemy, and that's the worst case scenario ultimately. Yeah, and then you know the reason why it irritates me to be to be you know a little bit more. Um, expand on a little bit more is that I leave my phone downstairs away from me on purpose so that I don't I'm always on my phone and then I go outside and, and and I'm busy on my iPad with my kids or something and I need to do something and now I have to go back to my phone 
because it's all set up there and, it, and it's just that it's made it more friction and 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 you know we've had i mean i've heard stories anecdotally of people that have been you know uh held up mugged whatever and they've had to open their phone up with the biomet you, you know facial recognition anyway and had money transferred out of their bank account because it's all facial recognition so there's nothing to type in there's no second factor oh the second fact the second factor is on, on your phone anyway so how secure is it none of it's secure because that by that point it's it's already lost you know so it just doesn't feel like it's it's really making any difference no that first point you made reminded me of something because i also i'm trying to use my phone less and yeah. i think many people are trying to use their phones less because as you know and as many people know we're more addicted to, to them than than we ever have been in society and this is has its <laughs> pros and its cons so for me personally i'm trying to not let my phone distract me when I'm working. So I will put it out of the way and have it on do not disturb mode. But it's still there. It's just still reachable for me to type in my codes. <laughs> but if you're trying to really get rid of it and you're really trying to get in have it in another room so that it's on purpose difficult to go and get the phone, which I think many people are doing now, it's it's hard to do that now. I mean, I remember when I lost my phone a couple of years ago and I ended up with this, I still have it and I use it in some, for some things, this tiny little Nokia, almost like a 3310 kind of thing. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> it has snake on it, actually. Yeah. Um, and I was using that for as, as, a, as a work phone. And what started getting annoying was, I think it's Amazon, but a few other companies, when you sign in, they don't send you a code, they send you a link. Yes. This, yeah. <laughs> didn't have the ability to, to browse any website so i couldn't sign into amazon for a long time and some other things but it's just this kind of assumption that because everybody has a smartphone that companies think they can introduce these changes despite perhaps the fact that there are going to be some people that are not, not going to be able to use those services anymore yeah so it's, that's, that's kind of sad i mean it's, it's it's a real problem because you know if you look at what was it? it was a banking thing actually um someone was talking to me the other day about oh i was actually in the bank and someone was was in front of me trying to do something and he, i mean he must have been you know in fairness early 70s but they're trying to explain to him that he couldn't actually come into the bank anymore for these services he had to use the app on his phone and he was trying to explain to them that he didn't care about the app and the phone he wants to come to the bank because he likes to come to the bank and they were like well we don't have the staff to you know it was like this complete like disconnect between what the customer expects and customer wants to what the business is doing to be efficient and effective and whatever and he's like i've been in this bank 50 years you, you basically tell me that i have to that if that i can't bank with you how you know how we started our relationship i mean it was a long thing i you know i, I didn't stay for the whole thing but it made me think like I take for granted that I can just transfer money off my, in an app. And, you know, my, my father-in-law still uses checks and I keep saying to him, checks are not secure. And he goes, if I send a check, someone will phone me to confirm that. And I said, yes, but who says the person phoning you to confirm that actually works for the bank? Oh, I didn't, I didn't think about that. And I said, you know, checks as, as much as they're accepted, they're a, they're a dying thing. And it, and, and this is the constant problem you have. I think with with any new thing is is you got to you got to remember the the people that that are not in the sweet spot of where it's aimed to you know where, you know because obviously it's aimed to the people where it's going the, the, the sort of the target market and then you always have the laggards behind that that have to be catered for as well and it's tough I don't I don't think it's an easy answer but it should never be forgotten absolutely no I worked in a building society for some time and they had. The more, the more time I spent in that company, I was obviously on my focus was security, but it was interesting to view that wider scope and understand there was relationships between, they called them members, not customers, the members and why they go to a billing society. And billing society is a, a, couple, a couple of them aside, they're kind of like banks, but 10 years ago in most cases. Yes, yes yeah. <laughs> so it was all about that exact thing. It was all about that relationship. They... They, look, they would look forward to some of these members to going to the bank and having a conversation, not just with the cashier, but also other people <laughs> that are yeah. in the bank. Yeah. And they would, I think there was even at some point, you you could come in and have a cup of tea and a biscuit whilst you're having your, doing your transactions, taking your pension out. And they, I think the building society that I worked for were very, they wanted to keep that 
that side of things. And of course, a lot of their members at the time were were quite old. I think they were they had quite an an old member base at yeah. some point, and they were trying to also work out how to attract younger people. Yeah. <laughs> but that was super important to them, and I think they kept it. I'm, I'm very I'm very happy if that's the case. I don't know what's happened since I left, but. They're still opening branches. The funny thing about that as well is I live in Spain now, as you know, and in Spain, I could, I could not believe how hard it was to access a bank. So not only do you have to do most things online, but the, the problem gets worse when <laughs> if you want to visit a, ba- visit a branch, and this applies to all of the chains in Spain, well, certainly in Barcelona where I'm living, Yeah, you have to go between the hours of, I think it's, it's it may be nine, but it's, it's certainly... It may be eight, but it's certainly from nine to eleven a.m. So you have a two or a three-hour window sure. if you want okay. to go in and close your bank account or make a payment or do anything that requires the cashier's desk. Yeah, which is is a it's a three-hour window, and b most people are working during that window. Yeah, if you go right. at ten past eleven, you can't do it. You can hardly do anything inside of a branch. They say, "Oh, sorry, we we closed our cashier today," <laughs> and then the bank anyways closes at like three. So, um. It's very difficult to get anything done in Spain when it when it comes to the old fashioned way of doing banking. That's crazy. I mean, yeah. Uh, well, and this is the thing. I mean, it 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 becomes the friction becomes so high, and then you only have your only choice is to use the the apps or or online services, which which I guess for most people is fine. Um, but again, it comes back to security. I mean, you know, I, I'm on the phone, you know, trying to sort out some stuff at the moment. My wife needs to be involved, so now it's a case of. I'll talk to somebody and they'll say, well, now I need to talk to your wife. Oh, she's not here with me. Can't carry on until your wife's with you. So now I've got to bring her into the phone conversation somehow, either I dial her in or, or wait for her to come home and phone back. And all they all they want to hear is a woman's voice. And they don't even ask like really, you know, trying questions. But, you know, you know who's to say that that's not the, the cleaner or, or my neighbor that's just walked in and to just pretend to be my wife for five seconds, you know? That's the uh, that's the next wave. I'm sure you've come across at some point some of the advancements in deep fakes and how now how easy it's soon going to be to replicate someone's voice. Very, uh, very much. So. Not just uh, not just somebody who's famous and on TV a lot, but but any person in the street yeah. Yeah. that has some content out there that you can use to base your deep fake on. Um, well, that's happened already, and it's it's definitely going to be happening a lot more. Yeah, without that, I mean, I was I was reading a, a series of books, um, and and they they had deep fakes in there from almost the first. I mean, the books there's about nine or ten books in the series, and you know it's it's really worth reading. Um, and the stuff they were doing, I think it's completely possible. But like you know, not only the the sort of situation where and, and let's use it as an example today. Um, a deep fake of Putin and Donald Trump having coffee in New York City right now. You know, completely not going to happen, but they can they can fake it to the level that it's it's real. Um, there was another thing I saw of a bomb going off in in the U.S. city, and they were saying, "Oh, this is a deep fake," but you couldn't tell the difference. It looked like a real explosion. I mean, you know, we see everything on TV all the time, movies and films, and the news don't look that different anymore. Um, which is which is a problem, and then as you say, I mean, c- creating someone's voice. Um, there's a, there was that uh, there was a woman that had a model of herself created, and she was basically selling it for a dollar a minute. This AI model of her to go and interact with people. She made like seventy grand um, in in a day or something, and she said it. I think there was something on the lines of it went from being like a normal interaction to being like a completely red light conversation like within an hour of 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 it being used but Mm -hmm. you know that that created entity looked just like her talked just like her but it was completely you know systemic it wasn't it wasn't a a real person it was was a silicone person not the carbon person so that's frightening but it's uh, you know i don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle so i think there's there's other stuff that needs to happen the regulation the you know whatever it is Absolutely. Um, it's it's in a special industry because it moves so fast. I mean, I, I can't keep up with it many times. I, I hear about things that are happening, technology advancements, breaches. 
I hear them through other people. I can't I can't always keep up with this stuff, but the the deep fakes, especially the voices, I think it's I mean it's definitely already happened now. I mean, your story is, is is a nice one because people were able to access that and use it in their own way, which is interesting. The yeah. story I heard was a guy was found, had found some AI software to generate deep fake voices and used yeah. his own voice as the model. And the okay. way that he did that was to try and defeat an online banking security question process so that he could change his address or do something that you needed to get through the security check yeah. for. Yeah. And he trained his voice <laughs> and answered the questions with a with a human agent on the phone using a deep fake voice. That for me was interesting because that's a real life application of something that we were talking about, right? This is the this is the banking and the security side and how technology can be used now to um, bypass that. And well, this was just Yeah. I mean you you give me a great idea because so so the biggest difference that we know is coming back to the UK from South Africa is if you need to speak to a doctor in South Africa, you phone your GP, you pretty much get an appointment within an hour and you're being treated. In the UK, you could be on the phone for an hour and still not get through to anybody. And then you might, if you do get through, you might get a phone call that day, but you're not being seen by anybody. And your treatment could take you basically 10 days. Whereas an essay can be done, you know, you could have your, your, your treatment in, in two hours. Now, I was just thinking while you're talking about that, you know, having having an auto GTP sort of thing that that sits on phones in sits on hold. <laughs> you've given it the the symptoms of your problem. It waits for the to answer. You've now deep faked the voice so that you, so that they you know they think it's you, and, and they can have the, the 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 AI can have the conversation with the doctor um, to an extent to book the appointment, the follow up, whatever it is, and you don't have to wait an hour. Uh, you know. It, it, it's completely, I mean, and that's where I find that the GP service to be very archaic. It's kind of very backwards. But the amount of times that that is useful, like like, we, like you want to go buy a car. So you go tell the AI what car you want to buy. It goes and does all the searching. It does all the phone calls, talks to all the dealers, books in all the stuff. It's got access to your diary. You know, it knows which, what your insurance history is like. It knows what your income is. And it can answer all those questions. Because like we have to look for a car now. And, and I said to my wife, like you got to budget like two hours. To go and do this because it's not just driving there and driving back it's driving there then you got to talk to the person who's going to ask all the same questions you got to answer all the same questions then they're going to make small talk while they get the car ready then you're going to drive the car then you're going to you know get back then they're going to pump you for more information and then by the time you're done with that you don't want to do the next car because you're exhausted from all that stuff um go to the next guy they'll do the same thing but you could just short circuit the whole thing by just preempting all those questions with all the answers and just go and drive the car and yeah, I mean, I, a deep fake for that would be actually very helpful for the most part. Mm. You know, I think it's coming along, isn't it? I think there's now a chat GPT assistant, which is pretty much this. It's connected. I'm not sure if it's chat GPT or, or which one of the, the AI companies that is doing this now, but chat GPT becomes your assistant. You give it all the information about you. You connect it to your diary connected to your bank account you connect it to amazon and it just does <laughs> everything that you ask it to do with all the access it needs um without as you say having to wait those two hours on the on a phone or having to go into a branch um that certainly is the next the next level and i think there are some useful applications already that i can that i can think of for that but we're already there <laughs> essentially or we're very close yeah. to being there and it's still just well, the beginning I, I don't know if you remember the, the whole smart fridges thing. I think Samsung was trying to do it many ah, years yes. ago. And I mean, we, we, we find that again, being back here versus South Africa. So South Africa, very difficult to get. You can do it. You can get online shopping and you can have your, your local grocer supermarket deliver your food and, and all that kind of stuff. But it's typically you go out and just buy it yourself and, and come home. But then you're wasting time out doing it. Here is is the the opposite problem. You You mostly do online shopping for everything. But to get the slots to get your local supermarket to deliver um, is painful. Like it's never at the same time. It's 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 always you, know, you might have to shop with four different companies to get your food, you know, because of whatever's available slot wise. But and and the the way these guys protect it is they don't actually let their infantry or their slots be accessible publicly. 
So there's no APIs you can go and call and, and create your own thing. And in fact, this is how Ocado, Ocado started. They actually wanted to do that. They wanted to be the, the supermarket aggregator. So you can just provide your list to them and they would go get the food for you and deliver it. But because no one would do it with them, they became a, a, a default supermarket and they partnered with, with um, Waitrose and then with MS now. But, you know, the premise is you could basically train an AI to go log into all your accounts, Sainsbury's, Tesco, um, Waitrose, et cetera, and it can go and figure out the slots that are, are the most suitable for your cadence of buying things. You'll stay in a grocery list and just order the same things every week for you because you'll, I mean, we don't typically order that much different unless something's happening, like we're inviting people over or something. But it's pretty much we eat the same things every week. Um, and it's frustrating to the point that because we eat the same thing every week, we shouldn't have the problem of trying to find a slot. We shouldn't have a problem of having to reorder. It should be automated, you know, for the best price because you, you'd want some level of intelligence to say, okay, you know, for cleaning goods, Tesco is better than buying at Waitrose. But for quality of food, you know, Waitrose is probably better or m is probably better or whatever. It is. I mean, I, I'm not a... I'm I'm not saying either or at, at this stage, but I just think that that kind of noise work is, is perfect for an AI. Um, and if and if Amazon and, and, and I'm surprised Amazon hasn't solved this problem yet because I'm sure they will because they've got the the delivery network. Matter of time, probably. Yeah. Just a matter probably. of time. Probably. <laughs> Good. I see we close on time. I, I mean, do you want people to get in hold of you? And and if if so, what's the best place to to get in contact? Sure. I'm mostly active on LinkedIn, so you can find me, Ashley Woodhall, on LinkedIn. And in terms of the website, it is changing soon, but <laughs> for the next couple of months, probably it's going to remain practical-infosec.com, which is where there's a list there of some of the things we're working on, some of the services that we're launching. We're just about to launch, and this is the first kind of public reference of it, a security subscription service, which is doing away with the classic consulting model of going in to do an audit or a gap assessment in an organization and giving them a huge, long, complicated, boring report, which they're probably never going to do anything with, yeah. because that's what we've been doing for the last few years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the subscription model replaces that and makes it a, a bit of a Netflix approach of kind of bite sized improvements delivered. Every month, the subscription <laughs> angle can be cancelled, can be paused, can be turned up and turned down. So you move as fast as you want to move and improve as fast as you want to improve. That is the latest and greatest thing happening for us, but it's not yet on the website. All right. Great. But, um, LinkedIn is probably the best way to keep up to date. Super. I'll, we'll put that in the show notes. Great. Thanks for having you on the, well, coming on to the podcast. It's been great to chat. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Heather Bicknell is our producer and editor. Thank you, Heather, for your hard work on this episode. Please subscribe to the series and rate us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Follow us on Twitter at the DWW Podcast. The show notes and transcripts will be available on the website, www.digitalworkspace.works. Please also visit our website, www.digitalworkspace.works and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, if you found this episode useful, please share with your friends or colleagues.